I mean it, that the, the heart of what is going to lead to successful parenting after divorce all has to do with the process, with the how you settle things, whether you're talking through the legal system or whether you're talking in mediation or however parents are going to settle. It's, it's really, it's, it's stuff that's familiar to parents. It's working together. It's putting kids first. It's finding ways to communicate even in very difficult situations. And that's what makes mediation work. And that's what makes therapy work and other forms of alternative dispute resolution work in this circumstance. Um, but there is, this isn't just about how, there's also a big what here. And I want to spend the uh, last hour talking about the what, the, the, the content of uh, negotiating an agreement, what, what it is that goes into the agreement, what, what it is that parents need to decide, parents need to work on. Um, I particularly, I don't, I'm not just going to focus on parenting plans. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about financial issues to at least familiarize you with what some, what some of the backdrop is. Um, but I'm really going to focus on developmentally appropriate parenting plans. Um, in The Truth About Children and Divorce, uh, and this information is also available for free on, on my website, I develop uh, alternative models of parenting arrangements. Uh, we're also going to, we're going to talk about them uh, later in the talk today, that may be more or less appropriate for kids of different ages and for parents with different styles of relationships. Um, the, uh, in my view, the same plan, uh, say, for spending time with your parents doesn't work for a two-year-old and a 12-year-old or a 16-year-old or an eight-year-old. Um, that different plans need to be tailored to meet the needs of kids of different ages. I have recently run into, there, there is a surprisingly strong movement, uh, surprising to me anyway, now to have shared physical custody, sometimes 50-50 custody of babies to do things like order mothers to stop breastfeeding. Right? Breastfeeding, sometimes it gets talked about as being custody interference. Um, I don't agree with that. I don't think research on attachment theory supports that as, as we'll talk about it. But there are those who think, who take the position, it's 50-50 throughout the lifespan. Right? That's not me. I think you can have a plan that works for infants and babies if you have an infant and baby when your relationship breaks up that looks different for toddlers and preschoolers, that looks different for school age kids, that looks different for adolescents and teenagers, right? And when you get to adolescents, as we'll talk about, you have to think about three sets of schedules. You need to think about mom's schedule. You need to think about dad's schedule. You need to think about the teenager's schedule. Right. So I want plans to be tailored to, uh, or, or parents to think about tailing, tailor, tailor, tailor. <laughs> it's getting late in the day, constructing <laughs> a plan that fits according to their child's developmental needs. There's also different plans that are going to work depending on your co-parenting relationship. If you have a cooperative relationship, the sky's the limit. Plans can be more integrated. They can grow and change. That's a situation when joint physical custody really is going to work. If you have an angry relationship, change is much harder. Contact with both parents, with both parents, uh, is, is much harder for, for children. Things like joint custody and de developing changing plans over time are much less likely to work. If you have a distant business-like relationship, if you can make it work, if you can make the business work, you also have possibilities. If you can't, you limit them. So the, as, as we're going to get to as we go through this, the two keys and what I think about is alternative plans have to do with how old the child is and what the parent's relationship is like. And this fits perfectly with what I was saying this morning, and we'll revisit something like joint physical custody is the best and the worst arrangement for parents, depending on, on uh, the quality of their relationship and what we're going to add into it now, 
depending on the age of the child. That's what developmentally appropriate comes in. Yes? On the age factor, if there's a child that at a certain age, 13, 14, 15, 12, uh, sees where they want us to live more with one of the other parents, more time, let's say they have every weekend, every other weekend, but they want more time, is that also considered, or you just listen to the mom and the dad? Yeah, so, good question, okay? Um, and I, and I'll, my rule is, is these are parents' decisions, right? And that parents shouldn't be turning to kids to make decisions for them. Um, like every rule, there are exceptions to it, right? And if a, particularly an older child, in how old is old enough, that becomes an individual decision. Is 10 old enough? Ten's probably pretty young. You said 13, 14? Probably is old enough. If that 13 or 14-year-old comes forward and says, which is very common, if it's a boy, I want to spend more time with my dad, right? Um, I encourage parents to listen to that and to take that into account, but to still make that decision themselves, right? So that the 14-year-old, I was talking with somebody about this uh, at, at lunch, 14-year-old wants to make a change, having a hard time telling mom, he's been living mostly with mom, having a hard time to tell mom with this. Mom and dad come into mediation, dad tells me, the kid says this, I might bring the child into mediation, talk with him a little bit, and then just meet with him and mom alone, and help him to say to mom, look, mom, I love you, right? It's not that I don't love you. Um, it's not that I'm not grateful for everything that you've done, but I'd like to spend some more time with dad, too, right? And I want to get mom to listen, and then mom and dad to talk about it, and then for them to say, we've listened to you, we've heard you, okay, we are going to change the schedule. And I want them to do it both because I want them, in the end, I want it to be the parent's decision because I want parents to still have authority over that 14-year-old, that 14-year-old doesn't get to call the shots still. And I don't want that 14-year-old to have that responsibility of feeling like he's now done something that maybe hurts mom. Mom has accepted that responsibility. That's my model in general for a child of that age. Um, I can tell you that that's exactly what I did with my own daughter. Um, I, it's very difficult for me to talk about. Um, but I decided when I wrote The Truth About Children and Divorce I, that I would talk about my own experience. My oldest daughter, Maggie, her mom and I uh, split up when she was only seven years old. Um, for most of her childhood, um, we raised her in a joint physical custody arrangement. Um, when she was a sophomore in high school, um, she came to me and said, um, Dad, and this happens with lots of teenagers too, Dad, I'm tired of the back and forth, right? Um, when boys ask for my phone number, I only want to give them one number, right? <laughs> Too bad we didn't have cell phones back then. That would have solved that problem, right? Um, and, um, and she said, you know, you have the kids. I'd, by this time, I'd had four other children. Um, and I don't want to leave mom alone. Um, and I was devastated. Right? And I didn't say, okay. I said, we have to talk. And we talked and we talked. And my way of talking with teenagers, by the way, get them in a car. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, well, they can't open the door, right? You're driving fast, right? They can't, they can't go away. There's plenty of distractions, right? It's not like you're looking face to face. I think it's the best place to talk to teenagers, be driving around. We took lots of long drives. And after many talks in a number of weeks, and I talked with her mom to it. We didn't go, do, didn't go to mediation, but talked with her mom, who, I have, who we just successfully uh, had Maggie's wedding this past summer. We planned it together and paid for it together and celebrated it together. Um, she's 29 now. But I said, OK, I've heard you. We'll change the schedule. All right. But it was my decision, which, and her mom's, not hers. I think that's, that's how I want it to be taken into account with teenagers. But you do have to listen. And I want parents to listen to kids of all ages. But I want them to listen and retain the responsibility of themselves, not shift responsibility onto a kid of any age. Yes? You talked about the issue of custody interference. You talked about breastfeeding. 
Um, what about the fact that in some cases a father, let's say, um, is working two jobs and he's not been involved with the children, but loves the children very dearly, and then there's a divorce. In a sense, there is custody interference for him because he cannot prove um, that he was as involved in the raising of his son or daughter as the mother can. How does that um, how does that work out in the court of law or in mediation when you have a father who who really has doesn't have the kind of skills that the mother has? Yeah, in a court of law, it can work out in all sorts of different ways. It's going to depend on the judge and the argument and who's hired what lawyers and and, and so on. It could. He's not in the best position, um, but these days there are a lot of judges who think joint custody is the way things should go, depending on the age of the child. In mediation, I'd be inclined in something like that to, to go back to the idea of a living agreement. I see you want to be more involved with your kids. Let's start here. Let's then move closer and closer together, which is kind of the way it often happens in two-parent families, right? A lot of dads aren't as involved with little kids. They get more involved as kids get older. Why can't you do that in divorced and separated families, too? I mean, I want dads to be involved with their kids. I, I mean, that's what this, this mediation stuff is all about. But I just I want it to evolve naturally. I don't want it, and I don't want it to be a battle. I want it to be parents working together. So let, let, let me let me let me uh, get into some of the specifics of this and entertain questions. Not everybody will agree with me. I mean, there are experts who will argue that 50-50 for all ages is the way to go. Um, so let me just acknowledge that. Um, and there's probably others who think that I'm too generous with both parents. Um, anyway, developmentally appropriate parenting plans. So before getting into specifics of developmentally appropriate parenting plans, I want to step back and talk about the big picture and some specifics. The, from a legal perspective, and this becomes a problem when you're doing mediation, one of the, 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 the a central problem is that our rules, our laws, have been very unclear. It's still true in a lot of areas, our law, our, though our laws are getting more and more clear as we've gone through this social upheaval that we've looked at this morning of more and more people getting divorced, more and more people having children out of marriage, changing roles of men and women. Our role, rules are getting clearer, but they've been very unclear and there's a lot of lack of clarity. Um, so let's talk about some of those rules and what they look like and how they're evolving. Focusing on, first on legal custody, right? Again, terms are loaded. We could just, this is decision making. As I said this morning, joint legal custody is the new norm. I rarely see agreement these days where parents do not share legal custody. Uh, this means sharing decisions about schooling, religion, and elective medical care. Uh, although there is still room for debate about decisions like extracurricular activities. Right? You, you have child on a schedule, maybe with dad some days during the week, mom some days during the week. What do you do about that basketball team that the, the little boy or little girl is on that's some on mom's days and some on dad's days? Um, and there are dads in particular who say, I want sports custody, right? <laughs> she can decide about other extracurriculars, but I get to decide about sports. Right? In general, the law says hands off on these issues. But these are important issues, matters of real conflict between divorcing parents. Uh, and so uh, I will speak with parents in mediation about this and other day-to-day -day parenting issues even though it's really outside of the law. And here are some of the principles that I adopt in working with parents in educating particularly newly separated parents about legal custody. I'll talk to them about sharing legal custody, joint legal custody, what that means. And I'll say, this is what joint legal custody doesn't mean. Joint legal custody doesn't mean that you get to second guess each other. It doesn't mean that you have to agree on whatever discipline is going to go on in one home or the other. It doesn't mean that you have to be in constant touch with each other about day-to-day -day rearing decisions. It would be a good thing for the two of you to work towards preside, to, uh, developing consistency in rules in your two holds, households. 
in routines for your child, little things like bedtime and homework and so on. But the bottom line rule is that each of you needs to respect the other's autonomy to make decisions in their own household. I want parents to work towards those integrated, similar rules, but I don't want them to compel them to, particularly at the beginning when there's so much room for fighting over things like um, uh, clothes that, that one parent or the other might dress them in or, or uh, little, little minor rules day to day. Um, in order to facilitate this, I'll say we, you need some means for communication, these short, to the point, clear emails. I'll set up, as I said earlier, um, let's plan for a telephone call. One night a week, what's a good time for you? Sunday night at 7, Thursday night at 9 after the kids are in bed. Um, noon at work so the kids aren't around on Wednesday. Let's find a time, a five-minute phone call for you to talk about those sorts of day-to-day -day decisions that you need to discuss. Um, I want you to, uh, you, you can need to talk about things like, wait a minute, I forgot to tell you, Sally has an ear infection. She's on amoxicillin. When she comes to your house on Thursday for the weekend, I'll take the amoxicillin. I'm gonna, I'll drop it off on your back porch. Right? But you, you need to be able to pick it up within an hour or else it's going to go bad because you need to keep it refrigerated. Right? Parents need to communicate about this sort of stuff. So that's, those are the sorts of topics that we, <coughs> we discuss. Um, the parent who's not with the child oftentimes wants to maintain their relationship with the, with the child in the other parent's household. A common way for doing that is calling them, right? But when Sally's with me, if you call her seven times a day, that ticks me off and that interferes with my relationship with Sally, right? So what we'll do is, yes, yeah, you can call when Sally's with dad, when Sally's at mom, but let's do this. How about you call every night at 7 o'clock for a brief phone call with Sally? That'll do two things. That'll know if 7 o'clock works for you. Is that a good time for you? Yes, no, no, no. Before dinner would be better. That's fine. There's nothing magical about 7 o'clock. But if you have a set time, I know when mom's going to call. I know when dad's going to call. So it's not just interfering randomly. It's also, you know what's even more important than that? Sally knows that you're going to call at 7. You may not be able to do it every night. And if you can't call, maybe it'd be a good idea for you to send her a text and let her know that you're not going to be able to call tonight. And another thing to keep in mind, you know, Sally's only eight. She's not big on talking on the phone, right? <laughs> Don't be disappointed if all she says is, I'm fine, Dad, having a good time. Hey, Mom, you know, yep, oh, I don't want to talk right now. I'm watching a TV show. Okay. When she's at your house, it would be good to remind her that the phone is, call is coming so she doesn't get involved in things. But kids get busy, and we want her to get to be a kid. So understand, and the important part of all of it is really isn't her talking to you. The important part is she knows that you've been thinking about her, and she knows you're thinking of her and call her at the same time every day, which I totally believe all of that. Right? So we need to give each other autonomy. We work towards coordination. A lot of parents, after I've mediated their initial agreement, I'll meet, meet with them once a semester, meet with them at... Uh, Usually in August, we'll plan the fall. January, we'll pl plan the winter. May, we'll plan the summer. Right? We're on the trimester system in divorce. You know? um, <laughs> and help them to work out those, just those big disputes around schedule and, and so on. Um, okay. Lack of clarity also is a problem in the financial arena. I'm not going to focus on this very much, but uh, I mentioned these issues and you should be aware of it. Child support. Child support is that money paid to support from one parent to the other, but th there for support of the child. Until the 1980s, child support was determined on a completely individual basis. The federal government, who had this interest in reducing welfare that we talked about earlier on, says, no, no, states, if you want to keep getting money from us, welfare money from us, you need to come up with clear, specific child support. Now every state in the United States wanted that federal money. Every state has a formula for calculating child support. It's made life so much easier. Still controversial. There's still problems. One of the big problems that's cropped up with child support formulas uh, in more recent years is that 
how much child support you pay um, gets lowered if you have a certain number of overnights. I'm not sure. Does anybody know what that number is in Florida? 74 as of last year in Florida. 74 as of last year in Florida. You remember that number? In, in, so they, they changed it, okay. Virginia, it's 90, right? You sound like you have some experience. My guess is in Florida. Okay, you do. You. My, my guess is a lot of, lot of parents. Okay, good. So did, did, do a lot of people like to have, want to have 74 nights? Of, at least 74 nights of overnight in your experience? In my experience, there's so many yes. different cases. I have fathers that want to be with their kids, fathers that don't want to even see their kids, kids that want to be or don't want to be, vice versa. So it's hard to... Hard to pinpoint, but that number becomes a lot of times a focus. A lot of people want the 90 overnights. Sometimes it's for the lower child support. Sometimes for, for the symbolism of, by Virginia law, now you, that's kind of considered joint physical custody. And so you want to think that you have that nice symbolic term. Right? Uh, Interesting that there was the change from 74 to was 148. Yeah, it was 148. It varies throughout the country. The low in the United States is Indiana. 52 overnights you got joint physical custody in Indiana. The high is North Dakota, you need 164. It becomes a magic number. Um, that's one of the issues with um, child support. Just a little bit, just for a little bit of background, I don't expect you to become experts on this, but just to show you again, the problem is we need clearer rules. Clearer rules start to help. Property division. In, in place, states that weren't community property states, which is basically all the older states, not the West Coast states, in divorce, you got the stuff that you held title to. So if the house was in my name, sorry, honey, I own the house on divorce. The trend over time with property, though, is to assume that everything, this is more the community property idea, that all the property acquired during marriage is joint property, and that property is going to be divided 50-50. That's not a hard and fast rule, but that's the direction that things have gone in. The only issue that really comes up there, or the biggest issue that comes up there, is what's marital property or not. Have I kept my inheritance separate? If I've kept it separate, I get to keep it. If I haven't kept it separate, if I've commingled it with marital property, then maybe we're sharing in my inheritance now. Again, not an issue I expect you to deal with, just a little bit of a backdrop. Alimony, spousal support. Here's the, the big thing about alimony. Usually there isn't any. Usually there isn't any. Why? Couples are young. Gender roles aren't as gendered. People are poor, right? You know, it, it, nationally, the, the figures are there's maybe 10 or 15 percent of cases where alimony is awarded at all. And usually it's of limited duration for the same period of time. Um, outside of that, it's been a crapshoot. But just recently, just recently, there have been a movement towards coming up with alimony formulas, too. Right, that is a parenting plan okay, as well. Right. Rehabilitative, again, usually a short-term alimony to get the dependent spouse back on their feet, right, financially. Um, and just for your information, the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers, which is the um, main organization for trial lawyers in the United States dealing with divorce, has recently put forward this alimony formula as a suggested rule. In a few states, I believe Massachusetts recently, adopted this formula. It, it's there for your interest um, with an example. I'm not going to go into it now, um, just to offer it there for a backdrop. The biggest crapshoot left over is physical custody. Right. Every state in the United States says that physical custody should be awarded according to what what is in children's best interests, which sounds great. We all want to do what's best for kids. Right? But the question that comes up, and it comes up in mediation, it comes up for parents, it comes up in courtroom over and over again, 
What does best mean? What does best mean? 30 years ago, best was kids live with mom, see dad every other weekend. 20 years ago, it was revised radically. It's kids live with mom, see dads every other weekend, plus Wednesday night dinner on the off week. Right? Um, more and more these days, uh, best is maybe joint physical custody. Again, this isn't where I am, um, but some people say it's always got to be 50-50. It's a simple, straightforward rule, one that I have problems with. Uh, and again, as I said, and I want to go into it, we're seeing this even more even for infants and toddlers. Um, there's been a proposal out there put forward by the American Law Institute, which develops model laws that states oftentimes adopted. It's a principle that I like, um, but nobody seems to be latching onto it. West Virginia is the only state that's adopted it so far that says, uh, that says the approximation rule. It says it shouldn't be 50-50. It shouldn't be anything particular. What, what you should do is however parents are spending time with the child in the marriage, you should try to approximate that amount of time after a divorce or separation. I like it because it's a clear rule. It's not a one-size-fits-all rule. But it can be a problem for like the example that somebody gave for what about the dad who's been working for you know, 20 hours a week and hasn't been spending time with the kids, and now he wants to spend time with his kids. So there have to be exceptions for that. Bottom line is, the bottom line is, is that there is, is no bottom line. So I want to examine all of these issues. Here's how the law defines best. This is the Uniform Marriage and Divorce Act. This was put out in 1979 by the American Law Institute. Here's how, how judges are to decide custody. Put yourself in the position. Is, do we have any family court judges here today? Okay. Put yourself in a position of a family court judge. You have two angry parents coming in front of you. You're hearing information in a short period of time about not actually mostly the bad things about each of the parents. And you've got to decide where this child is going to spend his or her time. I think that's about as tough a job as it gets. I think that's a tough job. What does the law tell you to do? Now, again, there's variations from state to state, but most state laws take this model statute, statute at its heart. It says you need to take into account the wishes of the parents and the wishes of the child, uh, the interaction and the interrelationship of the children to their parent or parents and to the siblings, and to anybody else that significantly affects that kid's life. You need to take into account the child's adjustment to the home, to the school, to the community, and you have to take into account everybody's mental and physical health. OK, so what do I do? How do I make a decision? Virginia Code is, adopts this model standard. But to make it even more vague, they say, and then it says, and anything else that the court deems is relevant goes into that decision. This is a rule without any rules. Bob Manukin, who's now a Harvard Law professor, wrote when he was at Stanford this about the best interest standard. Deciding what is best for a child poses a question no less ultimate than the purposes and values of life itself. Should the judge be primarily concerned with the child's happiness or with the child's spiritual and religious training? Should the judge be concerned with the economic productivity of the child when he grows up? Are the primary values in life in warm interpersonal relationships or in discipline and self-sacrifice? Is stability and security for a child more desirable than intellectual stimulation? These questions could be elaborated endlessly, and yet, where is the judge to look for a set of values that should inform the choice of what's best for a child? Our laws tell these judges, do good things in a tough situation. Yeah. There's another situation that I hear a lot about, and that is there is a person who's living in the household, another partner that's moved into the household, who 
doesn't like the ex-partner and prevents the child from, from becoming involved with the, the father or the mother. Is that taken into consideration in terms of the best interest when you have a third party that's interfering? How would you know about that as a mediator? Oh, you, you hear about that. I don't want to get too far in it because it comes up all the time. I want to stick with the basics. You know, I don't want to get too far. So it comes up all the time. And it may affect different judges in different ways. In Virginia, it's a big deal. In Virginia, it's a big deal, particularly if you're cohabiting, uh, particularly in front of a more traditional judge, unless you're in Northern Virginia, which is, tends to be more liberal and accepting of cohabitation and, and so on. It's, 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 let's try to get there, but let's deal with some of the basics first. Again, the problem is the law doesn't tell judges the law doesn't tell lawyers. The law doesn't tell parents what they should do in this situation. My solution to it is, again, turn the decision back in parents. Who knows? And I say this to parents all the time. You know what? I'm a psychologist. I don't know what's best for your kids. I, I, don't, I don't think, and, and I've, I've looked at custody evaluations pretty carefully. I wrote a monograph in uh, uh, APS, uh, uh, Psychological Science and Public Interest, a few years ago. I don't think we have a good science for predicting what's best for kids in custody evaluations. It's not a very strong science. I don't think judges have the answer. They may have the black robes. They may look wise. I don't think they have the answer for your kids. And wise judges tell parents this very thing. I think you, the parents, have both the right and, I think, the responsibility of deciding what's best for your own kids. I don't know who else can make a better decision. Yeah. I'm, I'm a mediator, but I'm also a family mediator. I've also been involved in a highly contentious uh, post-custody battle. What tends to happen in at least Miami-Dade County in a highly contested case is that the judge will hand off like a baton that task to a uh, psychologist for a psychological evaluation. And then it becomes a tug of war to see who it's going to be because each one of those psychologists has a relationship with the attorneys. So it's a very skewed um, and very dis disruptive process in and of itself. It's intended you know, in, a, in a perfect setting to work, but it doesn't because it becomes political and it becomes economically challenging because obviously psychologists are people. And if the attorney's got to meet the gig, so to speak, is going to get more gigs. Well, they're human beings. Their, their thought process might be affected by it. And some of the judges really don't understand the literature and the science of custody evaluations, and they just read what it says at the end and don't read anything which, in the middle. Which is, which is what I would do as a judge, too, because what do you know? And this evaluator has spent time, and they have these, these, these tests for you. But I said this this morning. I'm not sure if you, if you heard this. I really view custody evaluations as, as a dispute resolution technique where the, the evaluator becomes the arbiter, but essentially whatever they recommend becomes the decision because judges follow those decisions. Well, if they were all doing what their discipline required them to do, it would be a great solution. Well, but it's very politicized here in Dade County, and it's a very dangerous vehicle. Well, well I'd, I'd, go, I'd go beyond that. I'd go beyond that. I don't think there, if there is, nobody has told me. I haven't taken the class in mind reading that I'm supposed to get in psychology. I don't yet know how to read minds. And I don't yet know how to give somebody a psychological test and tell parents how they should now raise their kids in, in a way that's going to be in this big, best way. I mean, I can't even very well predict what parents going to be more of a disciplinary and what's very loving. But even if I could predict that, I can't tell you which one of those alternatives is best. I think that's a decision for parents to figure out. Now, some parents abrogate their decisions. I do everything, and then a judge has to make a call, however they can. I, I want to do everything we possibly can to hand these decisions back to parents and as a society, like we're doing with some of the financial areas, to see if we can't come up with clearer rules to help judges, to help parents. That's going to be a harder test. Yep. You know, I was just going to say that we don't have a definition for what a good enough parent is in general. No. It's, no. Very, it's very, you know, it's open to grabs. What's a good enough kid? What's a good enough parent? Right. You don't know that, though, if you're a 25-year-old or 30-year-old appearing in court in the first time. You, know, you, you think there's something there. And we need to tell them, yes, there's something there. You, the mother. You, the father. Who are going to be mother and father forever. Right. There is a, an ethos that, particularly when, particularly when custody is disputed, and 
I have problems with this, you know, that custody should be shared. And when I'm saying custody, I'm talking about a schedule, time with kids. Um, more and more, this has been extended down to infants. Um, the, the primary concern with sharing custody with an infant or toddler has to do with that attachment relationship, that special bond that's formed between infants and their caregivers, usually their mom, right? Not always, but usually their mom. We know from all kinds of uh, research that's been done by attachment researchers that uh, having what's called a secure attachment versus an insecure attachment, um, secure knowing that parent figure is going to be available for you, insecure being uncertain of that availability. We know that a secure attachment relationship predicts all sorts of positive outcomes for kids down the road, whereas insecure predicts negative outcomes. It's not a one-to-one -one prediction, but it's clearly a risk factor for psychological problems. This work dates back to, uh, used to be my colleague Mary Ainsworth's work um, when she was at Hopkins and then at University of Virginia. Um, it, it even dates back in an older sense to, you probably remember the, the, the studies of Harry Harlow's monkeys that were, had the, either the cuddly monkeys and the, or the wire monkeys that gave them food, right? That basic attachment relationship is a predictor of future adjustment. That's the number one concern. Um, now, what do we do about infants and toddlers? Um, first of all, there's very little research that's been, uh, that's been done on divorce and alternative custody arrangements for infants and toddlers. Um, it's, to the best of my knowledge, there have been three studies done in the world. Um, and I talk, they're all in chapter six of renegotiating family relationships, which again just came out in November, so this is up to date. Uh, there's one by Solomon and George, finding more insecure attachment relationships among kids who are spending, infants who are spending overnights with their dads away from their moms, finding more insecure attachments. There is a study by uh, Marsha Pruitt finding that frequent overnights is related to more positive adjustment among four and six year olds, but either no more or less positive adjustment or maybe worse adjustment among infants. Um, there's a study by Jen McIntosh and Bruce Smythe from Australia, the most recent and the best one that's been completed so far, showing again that frequent overnights for infants and toddlers are related to more problems but once you get to four years of age, frequent overnights are not related to problems among kids. Um, I just completed a study of this topic myself. It's, I just submitted it. We'll, we'll see whether it gets through the peer review process, but also found in this study um, that uh, frequent overnights among infants is related to more insecure attachments in infants. Uh, we'll see what happens with that study. More overnights away from the primary attachment figure. It's you, who's usually the mom, but it doesn't have to exclusively be the mom. Okay. I, mean, I didn't hear what you said. I mean, the beginning. More frequent overnights with parents than the other parent was... Predicts more insecure attachments to your main parent, which would lead you to want to limit overnights away. Right? The For the younger kids, right for the younger kids. But, but there are a number of experts in this area. Uh, Michael Lamb and Joan Kelly wrote a couple of articles in Family Court Review about this in the early 90s who argued that in fact multiple attachments are more important than the primary attachment. They raised the concern that if particularly dads don't have interactions with their kids in lots, their babies in lots of contexts, that they're not going to bond and they're not going to form a relationship with, with their child. And so that there should be frequent overnights. And they actually, in this family court review, remember I'm associate editor of this journal, article from 1991, uh, 2001, I'm sorry, I believe, recommended that in fact infants should be rotating houses they don't want them to be away from either parent for too long, so no more than two nights apart. 
So every night or every two nights, they're going to have kids going back and forth in different houses. I don't support that myself. I, I don't think that's a correct interpretation. But that idea has taken hold. In my national sample, I found at least 5% of infants and toddlers, which isn't a big percentage, but it's a lot of kids when you look at these numbers, are having frequent overnights with both parents. McIntosh and Smythe found the same thing in Australia. So it's, it is a growing issue. What, one more thing, and then I'll get off of this. In the July issue of Family Court Review, if anybody wants to delve into it, the leading attachment experts throughout the world weighed in on this issue. Um, people like Everett Waters and Alan Shrew, um, widely recognized as attached. They all think this idea of frequent overnights with both parents at an early age is wrong. So there's not a lot of research. The theory says don't do it. The theorists say don't do it. The little bit of research that's there, to my mind, raises lots of cautions about doing it. But it is happening a fair amount. And if, I think it needs to be changed. Yeah? I'm not for or against it, but I just want to, I went to a physician summit um, last weekend. And they talked about breastfeeding and baby-friendly hospitals. And they spent the entire eight hours talking about the importance of babies breastfeeding for the first six months to a year. And I have to tell you, representing the fatherhood task force, I did not hear the importance of fathers being involved in the decision making or the application of breastfeeding. Although fathers, you know, don't breastfeed, they can certainly help. But that was that was not included. And I just want to say that that's an issue right there, is that it sets fathers apart from being seen as being capable or being interested in the early years or the early part of their children's And, and I, I think fathers are important too. And I come back to my solution is I don't want a one size fits all. Yeah. You know, I want that dad to maybe support the attachment relationship, primary attachment relationship with mom early on. I want him to develop a, a, an attachment relationship through frequent contacts, through trying to get along with mom. And I want that custody schedule, that parenting plan to grow and change where the child grows and change so that now by the time the child's three, he can spend an occasional overnight. By the time he's three or four, he's seeing him more and more. Maybe by the time he's six, you've got a real joint physical custody situation, right? I want parents and I want you to see time, not in terms of days in, of the weeks and hours, but in terms of years, which is the developmental context for kids, right? Think long term, exactly. What's that? Half day. Half day. Exactly, and, 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 and I want to show you some of those examples. So in the truth about children and divorce and in mediation, here's what I tell parents. There is no single ideal schedule, not joint physical custody, not every other weekend, not bird nesting. Do you know what bird nesting is? That's where the kids stay in the house and the parents move in and out. It's, it's, it, it's gotten a lot of press. I, I, I've worked that out a few times. Usually it's like a temporary schedule where couples are separating. It's not the answer either, right? There is no answer, right? Um, what parenting plan is going to work depends on what works for you and for your child. This vague best principle makes sense, except you've got to be the one to decide what's best. Judges, psychologists don't possess a special wisdom that can tell you what's best for your kids. There's no mysterious test that's going to answer this difficult question. If you push them to, somebody else will make a decision for you. If I'm in your shoes, I want to make my own decisions about my own kids. As I just said, I want you to think about time with your kids, not in terms of hours and days and weeks, but in terms of months in years. Right? I want your parenting plan to not to be a living agreement, one that grows and changes along with your child. And not only along with your child, along with your changing family circumstances. You get remarried, you move. Things are going to have to be renegotiated. I don't want you, and you know what? I don't think even you know what's going to work best for your child or for you. So when you come up with a schedule, 
let's be good empiricists about it. This certainly fits well with our evidence-based uh, approach here. Let's try a schedule and let's see how it works. And if it works for you, great. But before we sign off on the document and make this a formal agreement and have the lawyers file in a court, let's live with it for six weeks or maybe six months, depending on the parents, and see how well it works for your kids. And if it works well, that's great. We're certainly going to come up with the best plan we possibly can. If it doesn't, let's fix it. Let's do something better. Different schedules work better for kids of different ages. In general, younger kids benefit from having a home base. This is not, you don't need a PhD to know this, right? Um, school age children can manage more complicated schedules if their parents help them to make it work. And when kids get to the teen years, you have to take into account the third schedule, the teens, as we've talked about. Multiple kids creates both problems and opportunities, right? If you have a four-year-old and a 14-year-old, they may not both want the same sort of schedule, right? Lots of contact with both parents might work well with the, for the four-year-old. The 14-year-old might be wanting to see neither parent, right? <laughs> and actually, since they have a 14-year-old, the parents actually may not want to see the 14-year-old very much either, you know? <laughs> Even though you have to, I know you have to. But if anybody's interested, I have one for sale. Um, that's the problem. But the opportunity is, is if, if kids move in a herd, siblings can be substitute attachment figures, right? And more complicated schedules might work, say, for younger kids because there's older, older siblings that are going to accompany them as well. So it's both a problem and an opportunity. How you get along with your ex is critical to making your relationship work, right? Um, if you have, as I said at the beginning, if you have an angry relationship, you're locked in. If you have a cooperative relationship, things open up. If you have a distant relationship, if you can make the business work, you get lots of opportunities. Think creatively over time. So let me give you some concrete examples. Those are the principles. In The Truth About Children of Divorce, I talk about these issues to help parents think about them and then give them some concrete guidance, not to tell them what to do, but to help them think concretely about different alternatives. So I'm going to show you some different alternative schedules. Not to say these are magical by any stretch. It's, only, it's kind of like with our brainstorming we did earlier to help people think. Um, so with infants, the basic issues are you know, attachment security, right? Um, and there's both attachment security and infants certainly do have multiple attachments. But you don't need to have lots of overnights to form multiple attachments, although you do need contact to form that second attachment. Um, babies need stimulation. We all knew that. Babies need to be safe. They need nutrition and safety. Uh, and safety. Babies need routines. I mean, I, I don't know how parents succeed in doing it. Some apparently do. But I know even just going on a vacation with the babies to try to get them to sleep in a strange place, that's hard, right? Getting routines and sleeping and feeding, going back and forth from home to home. Boy, you're introducing lots of complications for parents and for kids. Um, two parents often work, right? If we're trying to come up with a parenting plan schedule, can we do something creative that takes advantage of the time when the kids would otherwise be in childcare, right? Are you working on different shifts? There's an opportunity that actually might save everybody some money if you can work this way. Can we think creatively that way? Um, should you never, ever have an overnight with a baby? Some attachment people will say, never, ever, ever. I don't. Okay, this is where I'm on the other side with some of the attachment people. Um, I don't think it's unusual for a baby to, say, spend an overnight with grandma, right? Does anybody really worry about an infant having an overnight with grandma? Ever? No. Regularly? Half the time with grandma? Then we might start to worry. 
But an occasional overnight, if it works, if the parents are working together, I can get behind that. Even though I'm, so I'm not on the 50-50 bandwagon by any stretch, but I'm not on the never ever bandwagon either. Um, so if you've got an angry relationship, here's what you might try to do. See dad during the day, a couple times during the week, so dad can have his time with the child, and so that the child can bond and form an attachment relationship with dad, right? Babies form attachment relationships with childcare workers, with babysitters, with nannies. I know lots of fathers of infants don't want to think of themselves as being a nanny, and I'm not saying that. I'm saying if you love your kids, if you love your baby, this is what's probably going to be best for your baby. I'm not saying you're a nanny. I'm saying you're a dad. I want you to be a dad. This is what a dad does. If you have a more distant divorce, maybe you can have even more frequent contacts. And if you have a cooperative divorce, maybe you can have lots of contact, maybe taking place some of that child care, and maybe add in an occasional overnight to the schedule too. Certainly not 50-50, but maybe an occasional overnight, if that seems to work for your child and your circumstance. What happens when you get to the toddler age? Well, now you get the terrible twos, right? If attachment of forming that loving relationship is number one for infants, that attachment bond is still critical for toddlers. But what parents need to start to learn to do and parents and toddlers need to learn to deal with is the word no. Right? Parents need to start to discipline. Toddlers don't love it. They need to learn that lesson. Right? Um, Multiple attachments become more important. Oftentimes, toddlers are, are starting to go to preschools, for example. They're spending more time in daycare. Hopefully, now they've got a good attachment relationship with, with dad. Routines are still important, but not as critical. We have toileting issues come into play. Um, peers start to become important. And toddlers have a vague sense, but not much of one still, of time. Right? By the time you're three, you've got a sense of time. You know day and night. You don't know weeks. You don't know a calendar. You don't know a schedule. You know, you're still a long ways from that. You're very, very concrete. Um, if you have an angry divorce, regular overnights might work, but not a lot. If you have a more distant divorce, you might, again, have regular overnights added in with frequent contacts. And if you have a more cooperative divorce, again, you're preserving that secure base but you're getting lots of contact with the other parent as well if you have a cooperative divorce. By the way, these are looking at both at arrange schedules you might arrange for a child of a given age. It's also we're looking at how schedules might grow and change as children grow, grow and change and grow older. And so now, maybe that baby has become a three or five year old, a preschooler. Now we have peer relationships are starting to become more and more important. Gender identity is becoming clearer now. Um, time concepts are expanded. I don't really know the days on the week, but I can look at a calendar and understand. Calendars are good things for preschoolers and early school age kids. This is when you're going to be at mommy's. This is when you're going to be at daddy's. It's concrete. I kind of got a sense of what's going on now. Um, fears come into play. I've had many times where, where an angry parent will come in and say, his mother is saying bad things about me. I know it because he's looking in the dark for scary monsters. She's filling his head full of things. And they're, no, he's three years old and he's developed an imagination, right? He's afraid of the dark, right? He's afraid of monsters. Um, they're starting to learn to be, uh, 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 regulate their emotions, again, growing out of the discipline. Attachments are still important, but separations are tolerated a lot better. In here, we can now, by the time three, to five, for the angry divorce, we can now start to have that every other weekend plus maybe the off Wednesday overnight. For the more uh, cooperative, divor distant divorce, we can have maybe every Saturday overnight. Lots of contact, lots of regularity. And for a cooperative divorce, we're still not to 50-50 yet, but we're having lots of contact with both parents, lots of overnights. School age kids, school and homework are obviously becoming important. We now have a good sense of time. Peers are important. 
um, loyalties to parents might become divided. Um, but we certainly have a lot more range of schedules. But now look at something is happening here. With the angry divorce, I can't think of anything too much more creative because these parents aren't working together except the same old, same old, every other weekend plus the off night because I don't want to put this kid in the middle of a war zone. But now we can be more and more. I like with early school age kids, rather than go to a week to week shared schedule, I like to divide the week because I don't know about you, but I think of my own schedule in terms of what day of the week it is, not what week it is. It's, I think it's harder for kids, particularly school age kids, to think of, is it mom's week or is it dad's week? It's easier for them to think about, oh, is it Thursday? Well, I'm with dad on Thursday and Friday. If it's Monday, oh, I'm with I know that much. And if you have a cooperative relationship, maybe now you've gone to complete 50-50 arrangement. Um, one arrangement that gets talked about a lot here that you may that's at least worth mentioning, that's a true joint physical custody that keeps the same schedule from week to week, is Monday, Tuesday, night overnight with one parent, Wednesday, Thursday, overnight with the other parent, three-day weekends swapped off, every alternating. It's not as complicated as it sounds because it actually works out to be a five-day than a two-day schedule for, for kids. Um, it's not my favorite, but it's one that if your parents are into it being 50-50, that's at least one option out there. I, I prefer schedules that stay the same from week to week. Um, school age kids, peers and extracurricular activities are coming into play. Um, puberty may or may not be coming into play. Um, late school age kids are not so divided in their loyalties. Late school age kids know what's right and what's wrong. Um, they may begin to voice preferences themselves. Interestingly, we're locked into the same old, same old for the angry divorce. Cooperative is starting to get locked in, but now if you have a, a distant is getting locked in, I'm sorry, but if you have a cooperative, you can divide the week. You might go to a week-to-week -week schedule, which lots of parents seem to like. It's, not, again, not my favorite with an exchange on Friday or Sunday night, but it works for lots of parents. And then we all know the issues that come into play with adolescence, but again, you're still locked in with the angry divorce. With the distant divorce, you haven't got a lot of creativity left. But again, the sky's the limit, although the teenager, once again, may want to change the schedule. Um, again, I offer these examples as examples. They're ways of what I think of as priming the pump. I don't know if anybody ever used that old, an old hand pump where you had to put the water in it to prime it to get it working. Um, it's a way I give the examples to get parents thinking about, about what's best for kids of a certain age what's best for parents with different kinds of relationships, and ultimately what's going to be best for your own family. Um, in the end, there's no perfect arrangement. Kids' needs change with age. Angry divorce gets locked in. Um, and it really is until we come up with a better, clearer rule in the law, it's a parent's decision about what's best for their own kids.